Okay, so today we'll be discussing domestic violence and how that impacts families. Okay, so as an introduction, um, for our basic um, understanding of domestic violence, domestic violence is defined as violent acts between family members or between partners in intimate or dating relationships. So that's kind of a broad definition of domestic violence, but we'll dive into exactly what that means. We're going to talk about domestic violence as a social issue and how it's approached through public policy or how uh, researchers and theorists will kind of address domestic violence and the reasons behind it um, through kind of the social lens. We'll discuss how we study domestic violence or how we understand it. We'll also um, learn more about uh, child abuse, the long-term effects, how it happens and how it occurs. And then we'll talk um, about why domestic violence as a whole occurs. And then finally, we'll wrap up with public policy. Okay. So domestic violence has occurred throughout history. In the colonies, the Puritans believed that it was the government's responsibility to enforce moral law through um, the law itself. Uh, but this excluded spousal abuse, specifically husbands abusing their wives. However, in 1641, um, you'll have to look up the specific colony, but the colonies, I think it was Boston, um, enacted the first law against women, um, against wife beating in the Western world. Uh, but this law wasn't necessarily always enforced. In the 1800s, uh, the child protection um, movement kind of arose as children were being seen less as an economic asset and more as emotionally rewarding beings in need of nurturing parents. As a result, laws were written to protect children from undue parental severity, but again, the law was unclear on what abuse um, was or what a punishment was. Um, so again, a lot of ambiguity in those early years when these laws were being enforced. In the 20th century, two ways of thinking about domestic abuse began, abuse began to emerge. Uh, the first is known as the political model, which tries to understand the relations of power and authority between men and women as an explanation for domestic abuse. With this model, theorists and historians argue that domestic abuse occurs when men want to have power over a woman's behavior. So the goal in this particular model is control. So throughout history, social structures have supported men's control over women through laws and social customs. And in the past, the law allowed men to exert physical control over their uh, over women, specifically their wives through um, wife beating or things like that it was considered punishment. Um, for these adult women. Um, as a result, the political model argues that domestic abuse is rooted in laws and customs that enforce male dominance and encourage control. The other way of thinking about domestic abuse is through this uh, medical model, which understands abuse through a lens of illness. So people who are um, who use this model argue that um, victims and perpetrators of violence may suffer not only physically but mentally and point to links between abuse and personal history and medical history as an explanation for the abuse. So sometimes um, with this model, um, people will paint not just the victim, but the abuser in a more sympathetic light. And laws have been enacted that not only ensure imprisonment of the perpetrator, but also ensure that they receive medical care as well through mental health services. Um, this model is um, more popular today. I You'll see this model a lot when we talk about people who this is very different, uh, but for serial killers. So when people do analyses on serial killers, um, they'll try to understand their back hit story. They'll try to understand the like um, how their home life and their family life and um, early instances in their childhood may have led them to be like this. Um, we also kind of use this type of thinking to understand abuse um, that occurs um, uh, between family members and intimate partners. So we try to understand it. We try to use this lens through domestic abuse um, as well. So there's that. Um, so those are kind of the two models um, that we use to try to kind of understand domestic violence as um, a social issue. However, when we think about the issues regarding domestic abuse, we often think of it 
also within this kind of more political sphere. So the 1970s, the feminist, feminist movement succeeded in making violence against women a political problem uh, by combating rape um, um, and rape laws, because at the time they were pretty lax and not a lot was being done about it. Um, and they also were able to form services like hotlines, crisis centers, and find legal support. And they also were able to change laws to support abused women, um, which was a huge movement at the time and has led to lots of change, changes nowadays. Like now we have, you know, domestic abuse shelters, we have hotlines, we have victim services, um, things like that. And at the time in the 1970s, that was kind of a newer thing. So the feminist movement really um, pushed for that and for the creation of those. Um, and nowadays the laws are much clearer about what abuse is. Um, it wasn't until recently that we had laws against stalking. Um, so politically and in regards to the law, our laws have become a lot stricter and they've been a lot more clear about what is abuse um, what entails abuse and what are the punishments for it, which is a huge step forward. Uh, but there's still lots of work to do because the stocking laws are not the best um, still. So anyway, we'll move on. Uh, when we talk about intimate partner violence or I'll call it IPV from this point on, there are typically two types of violent patterns that we see um, in this type of violence. So the first is gonna be called situational couple violence which occurs when one or both partners act violently in anger during a specific situation. Um, an example of this may be when a woman may find out that her partner has been cheating on her and during that confronta confrontation, she slaps her partner um, in response. Another may be during a fight, a male partner um, pushes his partner in anger. It might not be super aggressive, but just push. Um, but still that is you know, physical harm done to another person. Uh, this form of IPV is more common with men and women um, and equally likely, and men and women are equally likely um, to report engaging in this um, situational couple of violence. However, the behaviors that can occur in situational couple of violence can range from um, things that are less serious, like grabbing, pushing, or slapping, um, to more serious behaviors, like threatening their partner, um, with a knife or a gun, uh, but it's rare that um, this type of violence escalates to those more serious forms of violence and it rarely results in serious in in injury. Oftentimes marital counseling and therapy can stop this type of violence as most couples who engage in this particular type of violence um, often don't have great conflict management skills. So it's more of a matter of learning how to handle conflict better um, because when this violent does occur, it's pretty isolated instances. It's not a continual reaction to um, conflict. It's not like this happens during every fight. Usually it's big blowout fights where the violence might occur. But again, they're pretty isolated instances. So it's not great, but it is something that couples can seek counseling for and get support for um, and potentially fix in their relationship. The other type of violence, which is coercive controlling violence, not so much. So within coercive controlling violence, there's a pattern in which the perpetrator seeks to control the behavior of their partner through repeated serious and violent acts. So this type of violence is less common, but has more serious consequences. Um, the main goal of this violence is to gain control. So with this type of violence, Control is the goal. A situational couple violence, it's more of a lash out in anger. This one is they have specific goals of controlling their partner um, through any means necessary. Um, and this can be done in a variety of ways. Um, oftentimes what will happen is um, they might start to isolate their partner from family, friends, um, a community that they've found really important to them um, so that, that their partner can only rely on them. They also may try to gain control through finances. So controlling bank account, how much money their partner receives, um, maybe discouraging their partner from working just for the sake of having complete financial control over them. And then as a result, only giving them minimal amount of money so that it can't save money to ever leave them potentially. Um, another thing that can be done is um, obviously physical abuse. And we're not talking about 
every once in a while we're talking about repeated during every fight physical abuse or threats of abuse are used there's also manipulation tactics so sometimes this can look like a partner threatening to hurt themselves if they're if their partner were to leave them um, a partner threatening to hurt others um, threatening to hurt their the, like their partner as well just a lot of manipulation tactics um, it's very systematic as well the textbook only refers in their definition of this type of violence only refers to men being perpetrators of this type of violence um, but women also engage can engage in this type of violence it's much less common for women to engage in course of controlling violence. It's much more common for men to be the perpetrators of this type of violence. But I did not like how the textbook only limited its definition to men. I obviously women are also capable of engaging in this type of violence. It looks a little bit different just because the amount of force or physical force that a woman can use um, isn't as great as a man. So the physical injuries might not be as intense, but they can still obviously be um, pretty bad as well. Um, they can also, women can obviously engage in economic control. They can manipulate all the, isolate all these kinds of things just as much as men. Uh, but I do want to make it clear that men tend to perpetrate this type of violence more. I just really didn't like how the textbook limited to just men. Anyway, going off that rant, um, this type of violence is rarely, I mean, and I mean, rarely, rarely fixed with therapy. Like, this is not something that people should put up with or try to work through. Um, so the best option, if your partner does display this type of violence, is to leave that violent partner, partner and to leave as quickly and as safely as you can. Um, one of uh, your y'all's homework assignment is to watch a video where um, a TED talk where a woman talks about the domestic abuse um, that she experienced with a partner and he was definitely the course of controlling violent type. It was not the situational couple violence, it was course of and controlling. Um, and you'll kind of hear more about her experience through that and how she left. So um, definitely encourage you to watch that video, take lots of notes, things like that. It'll definitely cover more um, than I could ever cover on course of controlling violence. All right. Moving along, there is obviously no way to truly know how often IPV occurs because victims may never report or the violence may be underreported or downplayed by the victims when they are asked about it. Um, however, using data from the Bureau of Justice, we know that IPV cases have thankfully in, or decreased, I almost said increased, that would be awful, decreased throughout the years. For example, um, serious but non-fatal um, IPV against women has decreased by 72%, um, and simple assault by an intimate partner has decreased by 70% over the past decades. Um, a few things have led to this decline. The first was the Violence Against Women Act, which was passed in, I wanna say the 1990s, um, and that was also um, kind of pushed forward by the feminist movement, which is really cool. Um, and that provided sensitivity training and interpersonal violence for the police and funded legal services for victims. So things like um, uh, victims advocates and things like that. Um, the social climate also of um, IPV has changed and overall society often disproves of IPV, which decreases the chances of abuse and also teaches people kind of at a very young age that that's not acceptable behavior. Um, and obviously in the past, we talked about that with, um, you know, the way, way back in the 1800s, 1600s, it was very common for um, IPV to be kind of considered um, a way to discipline your partner. Nowadays, that would not be considered acceptable. So again, that kind of, in a way, decreases the chances of IPV occurring because it's a socially unacceptable. Um, but obviously the current risk of IPV is still very high, especially for women. As of 2010, the chance of a woman being raped, assaulted, or stalked in her lifetime is about 36%. Um, the percentage of women who are killed by someone that they've known, specifically when we th think about this, is it's often a romantic partner, um, has risen by 30% to 39%, um, from 30% to 39%. Overall, women are more likely to experience IPV receive a serious injury from an intimate partner. 
there are some people who are at higher risk to experience IPV, um, obviously women um, in general, but women who are separated but not yet divorced from their partner report the highest rates of IPV. Uh, this may be that maybe because that women who are separated but not yet divorced are more likely to have ended their relationship because their partner was violent and the divorce process just might not be final because of their partner being resistance or the legal process is kind of holding them up um, to kind of finalize that divorce. Um, lower income couples also report having higher rates of IPV when compared to middle class couples. Uh, having less education is also correlated with being um, a more coercive and controlling partner. Um, again, we're not sure why exactly that, that's just kind of the trend and that's not the case for everyone. Uh, research has also found that employment instability and financial strain may be a contributing factor to IPV, which could potentially explain why lower income couples or couples with less education may experience it a little bit more. But again, um, that's not the case for everyone and um, we're still trying to kind of sort out the reasons for that. Now we're going to move on to child abuse. Uh, it's defined as an act by a parent or a caretaker that results in death, serious, energy, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse, or exploitation. Uh, however, the most common form of abuse um, for children is neglect, uh, with more than half of all ch child abuse cases being labeled as neglect cases rather than abuse cases. Uh, the most common kind is educational neglect, in which children are not regularly attending school and parents weren't making an effort to have them attend school. Um, and a lot of kids can get arrested. I shouldn't say a lot of kids get arrested, but it is an opportunity there. It's possible for children to be arrested or the parents to be arrested for truancy. Um, other cases um, that include neglect include physical neglect which occurs when children are left unattended or poorly supervised by parents or live in situations that are not safe for the child, like an unkept house, uh, kind of like courting situations or where, you know, rat infested, things like that, um, or homes where drugs are easily accessible to the child. Overall, though, uh, child abuse cases have declined over recent years. However, child abuse does have really long-term consequences. So, for example, when a child experiences sexual abuse, um, oftentimes they'll display inappropriate sexual behaviors at a young age. Uh, they'll report feeling later in life feeling betrayed or a lack of trust. They'll often have poor self-image, depression, lack of clear boundaries, and will often engage in sexual risky sexual behaviors later in life. Uh, for children who experience physical abuse, they may also struggle with low self-esteem, lack of trust, um, depression brain injuries, behavioral problems like increased aggression, and are at a higher risk for being arrested for violence later in life. Um, it should be noted that uh, poly victimization is common, meaning that children who are abused are likely to be abused in multiple ways, um, not just one. Uh, so they can experience both sexual and physical abuse or neglect and physical abuse, um, and that would be considered uh, poly victimization. If you're interested in learning more about long-term effects of child abuse and how professionals go about maybe treating it or understanding it, um, I would definitely recommend reading the book, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog by Dr. Bruce Perry. I read it um, and he goes over um, different case studies that he did throughout his, car his career and what he experienced and kind of the symptoms of abuse among children and how he went about trying to kind of help them heal from that trauma. So definitely recommend that book. It was very eye-opening um, and very well-informed. So yeah, now we're going to move on to elder abuse. So last lecture, we talked about older people um, and their families and their intergenerational ties. So this is obviously something that they can experience, and we didn't cover this last lecture. So elder abuse is defined as abuse or neglect of an elder person or a um, by a caregiver. That could be a spouse, family member. Um, an employee of their assistant living home, just any caregiver. Only a small portion of elder abuse cases report physical or sexual abuse. Other forms of abuse that are a little bit more common are verbal abuse, harassment, humiliation, or financial abuse. Um, specifically, financial abuse is very common um, among elder abuse cases. Uh, my mom, she actually was a social worker for these types of cases, and she was 
particularly worked with elders in her community and often engaged um, or worked on elder abuse cases. And she said that the most common one that she would see is financial abuse um, or people kind of taking poor care of um, an elderly person um, or not giving them the care that they needed in order to save money and keep more of their um, finances. So that is pretty common. Uh, Elder abuse um, is most common among older people between the ages of 65 and 74 years old, so that young old population that we see. And the children and spouses are the most likely to be the perpetrators of elder abuse. In fact, living with a family member increases an older person's likelihood of being abused when we compare them to older people who live alone or in assisted living or skilled nursing facilities. I know skilled nursing and um, Assisted living places often get a bad rap, but they are less likely to experience abuse in those areas, in those places, because there's lots more checks and balances there um, that kind of help prevent that abuse. During emerging adulthood, um, people between the ages of 13 to, or between the ages of 18 and 30 um, are at an increased risk of experiencing physical or sexual aggression. Um, in fact, between 25% to 50% of emerging adults report violence in a relationship within the last year. Um, it's becoming much more prevalent in this particular age group than, in before, than ever before. Those who experience a pattern of breakups and reconciliation, so those on-again, off-again relationships, are at a particularly high risk uh, when compared to those in other types of relationships. Um, Sexual aggression in particular is really high among college students in this kind of younger emerging adulthood age. Uh, one study found that 19% of college women reported experiencing a sexual assault or attempted assault since entering college. Oftentimes drugs or alcohol were a factor in those, assault, in those assaults or attempted assaults. The men who committed these assaults are more likely to have shown a general hostility towards women believe that men are more dominant and that women should be subordinate to them, show greater uh, physiological arousal when presented with rape scenarios during lab studies, um, are more likely to consider violent acts against women acceptable, and are more sexually active, or at least that's what they report, when compared to men who don't commit sexual aggression. So again, um, it's going to be something that's important for your test is understanding who, what type of person um, perpetuates sexual aggression or sexual violence. So keep that in mind. Um, moving forward, uh, the reasons for why domestic violence happens vary based off who you ask or what theory or perspective you want to use. According to the political model um, that we talked about earlier, um, assault occurs because there is power struggle between men and women. However, this is a somewhat simple theory, um, and there have been several theories used to explain why domestic violence occurs. The, um, one of the first theories is the social learning perspective, which argues that individuals learn behaviors that they will later exhibit by observing what others do and seeing the consequences of those actions. So as a result, children um, from violent homes may learn violent behaviors and see them as successful and with little consequence. And as a result, they may be more violent in their own relationships. We often see this um, in the research. We, um, it's been found that children who grow up in abusive homes are more likely to be in abusive relationships and are more likely to be perpetrators of violence in those relationships because maybe a family member didn't leave or they had to continually watch the abuse of a parent and the parent never left or that was how they understood conflict management and things like that. So that kind of happens. Um, that's a trend we tend to see um, among children who grew up in violent homes. Another perspective is the frustration aggression perspective, which argues that aggressive behavior occurs when a person is blocked from achieving a goal. This explanation is often used to understand why violence is more prevalent in low income households. Uh, when someone is struggling with finances or cannot meet their basic needs, they may act out um, with more aggressive behaviors as more of a frustration tactic or a way to let out some steam, I guess. I don't, that's not a great way to describe it, but um, 
any frustration that they have in this model violence is not used for control but rather an outburst of displaced anger finally there's the social exchange perspective which argues that people calculate whether to engage in a particular behavior by considering the rewards and costs of that behavior and the rewards and alternatives to it so for example a man may decide whether or not to um, hurt his partner by considering the war rewards like controlling them and against the cost of violence, which may be that their partner could leave them or that they could get arrested um, and the reward of not being violent, like staying with their partner. It can also be used to explain why some partners may stay with a, a violent partner. All right, so in the past, um, some believe that men had the right to hit their um, partners, specifically their wives as a corrective action. Today, today, there are very few people who would find that acceptable. Uh, what we now may see is what's known as the soft patriarch, which is a husband who is affectionate and appreciative of his wife and spends lots of time um, with his children. Some may believe that it's okay to spank a child, um, but never use any greater physical discipline beyond that and would never use physical discipline against a spouse. When we look at laws, um, that address IPV, this will kind of vary from state to state and the severity of it will vary state to state. At first studies were conducted to see which outcome or approach to handling um, a domestic abuse complaint works best. So one study, I'm blanking on where it occurred, but this will be on your test, um, looked at um, whether um, arresting the perpetrator Ordering, ordering them to leave the home for eight hours or trying to mediate the situation um, would lead to better outcomes for the, the victims. But what was the best outcome was arrest because it had um, the lowest level of repeated violence because again, it was that immediate cost and this immediate, like we talked earlier about, um, you know, socially it's not acceptable for uh, IPV to occur. Um, it's very frowned upon and that really reinforced that idea. Um, unfortunately, though, at the end of the day, there is no cure all or surefire way for handing, handling domestic violence. Um, however, um, we do know that domestic abuse has negative impacts on every family member um, within a family and laws and policy are still working to kind of better understand the long term consequences and also how to decrease that. And we're seeing a trend towards um, decreased violence in the home, but it's still obviously very prevalent for some people. So on that note, there's not really a great way to wrap this up, but um, that is our lecture on domestic violence.